Sorry. No worries, man. So I will go through the reading of the Linux Foundation and Trust Policy. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors, and it's the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to missing agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and, and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in the Linux Foundation antitrust policy. If you have a question about these matters, please contact your company council, or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrea of the Grove of the firm of Gasmer of the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. So welcome everybody to this, this new meeting. Today we have uh, two new guests uh, and I'm honored to, to have them both here. Uh, the, we are joined today by Mr. Luca Castellani from Uncitral and we also have Kay. I thank both of them you know, for joining us today, for, for, for giving us their time. Uh, I would like to start first from, from Luca and would love to hand it over to him to, to have the first bit, part of the speech. Luca, please. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, many thanks to you for organizing this. Many thanks to Kay for uh, joining here. Um, we have uh, this uh, very close cooperation with uh, Singapore's IMDA. So it's a pleasure uh, to, to have this uh, conversation. I prepared a, a set of slides. I will do my best to try to share them now, um, despite the uh, one year plus of, of this current situation that we're doing still what the best we can cope with. My name is Luca Castellani. I work uh, in the Ancestral Secretariat uh, and I am the secretary of the working group that has prepared the model law on electronic transfer records. I would like uh, to... to I don't know if some, know someone if I, has, uh, I see, a, I, I can get a, an echo in my headset, so maybe someone can, can mute. Everybody's muted, Luca. I don't know, I'm trying to look if, if everybody, please mute yourself, but only the speaker should be, you know, Thank able you. to speak. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. So um, I will I will try to keep this, uh, this introduction as short as possible because I believe that we are all here in an in, um, informal meeting that, uh, that is made of, I, I saw many names of distinguished experts in this field, so um, I, would, I would prefer to have a, a, an open conversation about uh, these issues than to have like a, a one-way illustration of what, what is going on. But first of all, uh, just to be on the same page, uh, ANCITRAL is the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. It is a body of the United Nations system. I personally work for the Office of Legal Affairs of the United Nations Secretariat. ANCITRAL has been established in 1966, has been active for more than 50 years. Um, its main task is to uh, prepare uh, legislative texts that promote uh, the harmonization of uh, commercial law, especially international business transactions law. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say also now modernization. In the beginning, the, the mandate was more about harmonizing existing treaties, but now in many cases, Ancetral is trying to set legal standards for new issues. Uh, many of you may have come across Ancetral when dealing with arbitration, uh, maybe also sale of goods. In the field of uh, electronic transaction, uh, Ancitral started working already in the 1980s. Uh, what is important uh, is that we have four uh, legislative texts, three are model laws. That is to say they have, they, they work as a, as a 
source of inspiration for uh, national legislators. Uh, and so we encourage the national legislator to to take these model laws to and uh, to 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 use them uh, as closely as possible to the original model because that of course does help uh, to keep uniformity. But it's of course always possible to make some variations and sometimes these model laws there are choices uh, that, that help to make make it fit better the legal tradition of that jurisdiction. There is also one treaty uh, from 2005, the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications and International Contracts. What is important here, the main takeaway is that altogether, uh, these four texts have been enacted in about 100 states. So we are talking uh, about laws that are already in force uh, in half of the world. Um, what is important is that these laws, they cover different aspects, they are complementary, but they are all based on the same fundamental principles. And this does open the door uh, to broader adoption of the newborn, which is the model law on electronic transfer records. Now already at three, getting four. This is, of course, uh, the, the topic of uh, uh, today's discussion. Uh, you will see a lot of what I will say has has to do not only uh, with the function of uh, this uh, model law uh, to, to enable, legally enable the use in electronic form of uh, uh, transfer of documents or instruments, such as bills of lading, promissory notes, but also uh, because of this and the way it was uh, uh, enacted in Singapore. It is uh, the, the, the keystone of, of uh, the new vision that implements uh, uh, the concept of data pipeline in paperless trade. It is also compatible, uh, all, all antitrust texts uh, are technology neutral, but this one, uh, it addresses specifically its implementation with the distributed ledgers in the exploratory note. Uh, you can get uh, this booklet in electronic form, the text of the model and explanatory note in all six languages of the United Nations on the ANSTRA website, ancitral.un.org. So the core issue, as you know, certain uh, commercial documents and instruments incorporate the right to delivery of goods or payment of sums of money. Of course, I, as I am a lawyer, I will not say that these give uh, the title to the goods. Or, or to the money, but they, they are documents that represent the goods of the money and they, they give a good approximation of who could be entitled. And because they are very convenient, uh, there have been centuries of commercial practice about them and, uh, and uh, they, they are widely used uh, depending of course on the business case. So we are talking about uh, bits of lading and warehouse receipts when it comes to, to goods, bits of exchange, promissory notes, checks. And I see also interest for letters of credit, uh, although uh, whether they are transferable and negotiable, it depends on national law. Um, there's also some insurance certificates that can come in this list. At the same time, these documents may also contain interesting information about the commercial transaction. Uh, and of course, for the for the bills of lading and the warehouse receipts, they are very important as collateral in trade financing. Um, what the, the common element of all, all of these documents is uh, the fact that uh, the, the, um, they circulate with, with the delivery or with the delivery and endorsement, which means uh, that uh, in the business practice, uh, there is an assumption that they exist uh, on paper. Uh, they can be possessed, possession, uh, requires a tangible object. So, in particular, um, Ancitral has worked on the issue of electronic bills of lading. These electronic bills of lading ha have been something that has, has been has been pursued for some time. 
already uh, Antitrad is working also on, on uh, substantive maritime law issues. So you will see some elements uh, in the Hamburg Rules, which is a treaty from 1978 that deals with the, the rights and obligations of the parties uh, to a contract of carriage of goods by sea. Then there were two articles, Article 16 and 17 of the Model Law on Electronic Commerce. They have been enacted sometimes in some jurisdictions like Colombia, Guatemala, but they have never been implemented actually, as far as we know. And then uh, the Rotterdam Rules from 2007, this is actually a medium neutral treaty. Uh, uh, so bills of lading under the Rotterdam Rules uh, may be issued uh, equally on electronic uh, or, or paper support. But the Rotterdam Rules have not yet entered into force. Uh, there are uh, five states parties and it needs 20 states parties to, to come into force. So uh, this regime uh, is not yet uh, there. And in, in 2011, when we started working on the model on electronic transfer records, MLETR or also MELITA, um, we, we looked around for existing laws. And in some cases, we, thought, we, we found that these laws, they demanded the use of a specific technology, uh, some were based on registries and the PKI. They were specific to one type of uh, transferable document or instruments. So you, for instance, one registry for promissory notes. And in some cases, they also created a special type of electronic transfer record. What does it mean? It means that they said, this is an electronic promissory note, but it's not the equivalent of the paper promissory note. It has a special name. For instance, in Japan, there is the electronic recorded monetary claim, which is different. Uh, in some cases, this was successful. In some cases, uh, it was less successful. But in all cases, there was a multiplication of uh, IT solutions and there was the creation of, of a data silo. Um, another issue was the creation of so-called electronic bills of lading based on contractual rules. And I think many of you are familiar with that. But these are not real electronic uh, bills of lading. These are contracts based uh, uh, commercial documents that mimic between the parties certain effects of the bills of lading. They are not opposable to third parties and the law of bills of lading doesn't apply to them. When it comes to uh, the MLTR, the fundamental issues are, first of all, this is not a, a regulation. Uh, so some, some people may think that you know, we deal with the regulatory matters, we don't. This is purely enabling. It aims at removing legal obstacles to a specific problem, which is the use of in electronic form of these transferable documents and instruments. As I said before, it is technology neutral. So it's compatible with registries, tokens, DLTs, but it doesn't favor or mandate the use of any of them, which promotes interoperability. When it's based on uh, functional equivalence rules, which means the same substantive law applies to electronic and paper-based documents, which means the law of bills of lading, for instance, would apply to an electronic bill of lading that is issued under the MLETR. This is particularly convenient when there is a conversion uh, between uh, electronic and paper. It's rare that there is the other uh, change of medium between, uh, but usually it's because someone does does not or cannot use electronics or requires uh, the, the change of medium to paper. But there is no change in applicable laws. That's particularly convenient. And another uh, very good um, outcome is that, of course, uh, because the substantive law applies, all the interaction with third parties, including the user's collateral, remains just the same as if it were on paper. Then, of course, there is uh, the additional uh, dimension, which is the inclusion of uh, dynamic information, metadata, especially data originating from oracles, smart contracts. Uh, all of these things can be included, of course, in the electronic transfer record. One of the key issues uh, in preparing this model law was uh, the need to prevent double spending, of course. Um, Obviously, the starting point is uh, the paper document is issued in a single original, but we all know, and I will not need to, to indulge in this place, in this, in this forum on the risks of, of this assumption. Uh, that has more to do with um, practice and the ability to, to assess uh, risk based on, on past practice. 
um, although we have seen, especially this year, last year, uh, but we, sometimes we are not so good at, at controlling this kind of risk. Um, in the MLTR, this is achieved uh, uh, with two notions, control and singularity. Uh, that uh, makes sure that only one electron transfer record is issued and that uh, the, that transfer record is uh, kept under control from the time of the issuance to the time of presentation and, and uh, termination. The outcome is one electron transfer record means one claim for performance. Of course, it's possible to add additional safeguards, for instance, by using oracles, so that it is possible to link directly the cargo and the bill of lading, for instance. Technology gives us the possibility to do this. This is something we cannot do on paper. It's just a matter of implementation. As I always say, when it comes to electronic matters, Normally, we expect governance to, to be better because we have more data and we have possibility to have better analysis. It is true. Of course, implementation is key. Um, so uh, requirements for an electronic transfer record, I will not get in the details here, but of course, because the same substantive law applies, the electronic transfer record must contain all information, mandatory and optional, which is needed for the paper document. It does not need to be presented uh, visually in the same way, but it has to be there. And then uh, there is uh, the need to have a reliable method to identify the record as an electronic transfer record, as opposed to a, an electronic record which is not transferable. As I said before, to make it subject to control for the whole life cycle, and also uh, to retain integrity of the electronic transfer records. Uh, that uh, means uh, all the in information regarding what happens to the transfer of record after issuance has to be recorded, regardless of its legal significance. Uh, that's why the use of uh, blockchain and DLT may be advisable, because uh, uh, we know uh, in that environment, it is more difficult uh, to reverse uh, changes to electronic records. Everything should be uh, recorded probably. Of course, this doesn't mean that it's not possible to reverse the legal effect. The legal effect may be reversed by taking the appropriate action. But uh, historically, what happened is recorded. Um, and more generally, obviously, the, all of these uh, that has to do with reliable metal is implemented in practice by using trust services such as electronic signatures and time stamping uh, and um, uh, assurance of, uh, of integrity and so on and so forth. As I said before, um, the, the key problem here was the finding what is possession in an electronic environment, because possession is a notion, is a factual notion, but refers to the ability to uh, control physically an item. Uh, in a virtual environment, there is this functional equivalence rule that says uh, the, the, the equivalent of possession is control, and the electronic transfer record management system must establish exclusive control over the record and also identify the person in control. Uh, now we're not getting in the details of uh, what identification means, uh, but it is important uh, just, just for the specialists that where it is possible to make uh, the transfer of document instrument uh, circulate, for instance, uh, only by, um, by delivery to the bearer, this is possible also electronically. So the, there may be different issues here. Identification for KYC has to be carried out, of course, to comply with, with uh, this type of, of uh, rules. But at the same time, this does not affect the ability to limit commercial law consequences by uh, cir circulation to bearer or uh, anonymously. So basically, also on this point, the substantive law, as it is enforced in that jurisdiction, will apply also to the uh, online environment. Now, uh, getting to the policy aspect, I don't need here to preach to the choir by saying why we want to have paperless trade. The example of, sometimes I make the example of bank payment obligations, which I find very interesting, although um, we, we have diff different uh, level of, uh, of uh, uptake there. Um, one issue that is interesting for trade financing is that, of course, if the electronic transfer record is identical to the paper-based document, it also does not affect the 
capital requirements for, for the lending institutions. But when we go beyond that, and here comes the, the vision, and, and I think that's what uh, Kay will, will discuss more in detail, uh, we get down to the fundamental question. We have one commercial transaction and we have um, a multitude of commercial documents and regulatory documents. Now, of course, that I, we have to do on paper because information on paper is very st static. But do we need that when we have a dynamic information uh, in electronic form? Uh, do we need to replicate uh, this multitude of documents or can we think, rethink this process so that uh, we move out of this uh, fragmentation and into something uh, which gives us additional advantages? So the idea here is to put all this information in a single electronic transfer record. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we will share this information with uh, all business partners. Um, to the extent that, of course, it is relevant for that business partner to the extent that we can do so. And this is the implementation of the data pipeline concept. And the huge advantage of this is that that single electronic record, which is also transferable, of course, if we want to, to have it transferable, um, has the best data quality. So it's complete, it's accurate, it's up-to-date, it's authentic. So let's say, if uh, there is a problem, like for instance, uh, the ship cannot go through the Suez Canal, then automatically the information is updated in that record and that record will update the information for all business clients. As, as I said, um, it's, it's for Kay to, to, to give details of how Trade Trust is trying to implement that concept, but Trade Trust is not the only example of implementation. So why enacting the MLETR? Reduction of compliance costs, better governance, less errors, less, less uh, also inconsistencies across documents. I would say very important, uh, it can give uh, significant additional safeguards against fraud if, if it is well designed and implemented. Uh, it is meant to operate across borders. It has specific provisions. So uh, it does help uh, uh, international trade. So we have a long list of, of benefits. And the only disadvantage is, of course, uh, uh, that it's new. And, and so people may be risk averse and they need a little bit more of explanation about it. With respect to specifically to COVID-19 recovery, which uh, is, is a very relevant topic and it's a good illustration. Uh, if we go generally on paperless trade, we know that uh, paperless operations uh, minimize personal interaction, which means, of course, less less risk for the individuals because there is uh, less exposure, but at the same time also less risk for the business process because there's less human physical human input. Uh, very important uh, for a certain uh, goods like now vaccines, of course, if it's implemented a blockchain, it would be possible to give certain high standards of uh, origin traceability. This has been looked into uh, seriously by, by several players. Obviously, uh, if in this vision, we have complete control over logistics, financing as well, but also customs because we can integrate the single windows for customs operation in the supply chain. So we know exactly where the, the shipment is and we also know how to prioritize what we want to prioritize. Um, in the medium term comes the other aspect of it, the financing aspect, because if we have lower costs, of course, uh, uh, we are able to, to uh, have better access, especially for SMEs, because uh, we do have uh, more information about uh, uh, that client and we are able to, to provide a, a better service, both in, uh, in terms of uh, collaterals and also in terms of the credit worthiness of the client itself. So uh, the MLTR has been adopted in, in Bahrain uh, first, uh, in Singapore and in the Abu Dhabi global market. Um, it's specifically referenced in the digital economy agreements that Singapore has concluded with Australia, New Zealand and Chile so far, more are, are in, the, in, the, in the works. Um, it is uh, in bills that have been introduced in Parliament in a couple of more countries, and we do expect 
a few more enactments uh, this uh, year. Of course, the big discussion about this is going on in the UK and is promoted by ICC UK, but there's also a significant engagement of the Law Commission of England and Wales in this. So you may find quite a bit of uh, information there. I will stop here. I try to do my best to, to give you this, this overview. At the same time, uh, I do appreciate that I took a bit of your time. Apologies for that. Thank you so much, Luca. It was really, really interesting presentation. Uh, lots of insights, you know, that I would like to keep for the question and answer time for the debate. As you said, you were right. Let's give a, an interactive feel to the whole meeting. So I will hand it over to, to Kay. Uh, we'll love him to step in and to, to present, have his presentation. Kay. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, give me a sec whilst I load the PowerPoint. Okay, I guess everybody can see my screen. Perfectly. I can say perfectly. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Great. Uh, all right, great. Uh, greetings to all from uh, sunny Singapore. Uh, so my name is Kay and I work in the trade team under the Sectoral Transformation Group within Singapore's Infocom Media Development Authority. Uh, the team's director, Mr. Lo Sin Yong, is also uh, in, uh, in the event today. Uh, and I think uh, he, uh, he is one of the uh, primary inventors of the Trade Trust Framework. And uh, we'll talk a bit more. Uh, so this is a initiative called Trade Trust that we started conceptualizing some two years back uh, and uh, is reaching a certain level of maturity. So who's the Infocom Media Development Authority? Well, we are a statutory board within the Singapore government under the Ministry of Communications and Information. As a regulatory body, we oversee and implement policies relating to the ICT uh, media uh, and postal uh, industries in Singapore. Uh, we also run the PDPC, uh, the Protect Personal Data Protection Commission, and POFMA, uh, Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Office. Now, in addition to our regulatory role, uh, IMD is also responsible for driving Singapore's digital transformation through the use of ICT technologies. We work closely with organizations in industries such as trade, logistics, transportation, and trade finance to promote the adoption of ICT technologies in order to enhance our company's competitiveness in the global marketplace. So let's zoom into trade. Um, well, as we all know, international trade involves many parties exchanging a lot of information using more often than not silo systems that are not integrated with one another. Unfortunately, a lot of this uh, takes place over then paper. A lot of this data information exchange then takes place over paper, which is at last count, a uh, 2000 year old you know, technology. Uh, this medium is of course inefficient and in an often cited uh, analysis by Maersk and IBM, uh, this cost can be as much as 20% of the cost of actually transporting the actual cargo. And furthermore, silo systems are rife in the trade ecosystem, and these silo systems are not interoperable and are conventionally extremely costly to make them so. This was a point that was also brought up uh, by Luca just now. So, we do see a lot of pockets of digitalization efforts. Uh, one of those, uh, you know, government establishing direct connections to governments, uh, but that type of effort is really inadequate. The world needs a better way to digitalize that is fast, easy, and cheap, and enable the thousands of digital silo systems out there to interoperate. Hence, in trade trust, we focus on the two key problems in trade. 
Uh, number one, the inefficient processes because of paper. And number two, the silo ecosystems. So on the paper front, we have to have digital assets that are functionally equivalent to their paper counterparts. On the silo ecosystems front, uh, it isn't as easy as it sounds. Um, it, because international supply chains today involve many parties with many documents that are handed from one to another over along the value chain. And we have to cater for the varying degrees of digital maturity and technical ability as well. So we need interoperability, not just between digital systems, but even between hard copy and soft copy. All right. So what is the end vision uh, that we are driving towards? All right. To solve all these problems, what do we need to do? So we need to effectively digitalize two categories of documents that are used in international trade. Uh, so normal documents, well, those are the ones that are just used to convey information, uh, not too particularly difficult to digitalize, but, it's, but we don't just stop there at you know, just digitalizing it, right? We don't just stop there. We use technology to assure all the trade players that no matter how they obtain a, a, a document, regardless how many hands it had passed through before, that it hadn't been tampered with since it was created, right? So that's authenticity. Now, of course, trade players also need to be assured, as you heard uh, uh, Luca talked about uh, the need for identity, about knowing, right, who. Uh, trade players also need to be assured of who really created that document as well. So that's source. And lastly, uh, the other category is that of transferable documents. So these documents, uh, I'm sure you have um, gotten a very good brief from Luca in the previous section. Uh, so you know that they are a special class of document who have, which have the legal ability to affect performance obligation transfer from party to party. Now, the paper medium, slow to transport amongst all the different players, and necessitate risky practices such as the use of letters of indemnity. So on top of assuring authenticity and source of the document, we use technology to effect title transfers electronically in full compliance to the requirements of the law. So let's talk about trade trust then. Trade trust, is uh, not a platform, <laughs> um, it is a framework, right? Uh, this framework comprises of uh, globally accepted standards, uh, all so that we can connect governments and businesses to a public blockchain to enable trusted interoperability okay, of the electronic trade documents uh, used in trade across digital platforms. And uh, it is, offered as a digital utility. I'll, I'll talk about that. So to achieve this cross-border vision, right, for paperless trade, um, we don't just need the technology. We also need to address the change management, the legal and business considerations. So to do this, we develop four tracks. Uh, you can see them in front of you. Uh, legal harmonization, standards development, accreditation, and software components. So let's talk about legal harmonization first. So legal harmonization looks to not only enable electronic negotiable documents to be legally valid, uh, to be legally recognized, but to do so toward a standard that the world can get behind. And that's the MLETR or Melita, as, as Luca likes to coin the phrase. Um, this uh, model law, you heard a lot about it just now, right? And so um, you would also know that uh, UNCITRAL uh, is also responsible for the model laws on electronic commerce and electronic signatures, uh, which I think we can thank 
uh, to be able to shop on the internet today. So if you now look at the other track, the second track of standards development, uh, this deals with the creation and enhancement of technical and process standards at international bodies, such as UNCFAC, uh, that's the United Nations Center for E-Business and Trade Facilitation, and the International Standards Organization, ISO, uh, where we do all this in collaboration with experts from all over the world. And these are then baked into the Trade Trust software components. Uh, track three, accreditation is a optional feature within the MLETR. Uh, and number four, these are these software components, right? These are designed, okay, number one, these are released on open source licensing terms, and they are designed to be able to be easily integrated into backend solutions uh, and deployed on the, the different trade players existing IT infrastructure so that they can extend into operability beyond their own digital community, their own digital walk garden. So if you now look at uh, the picture in front of you, that's what Trade Trust looks like from a technical perspective. The application layer uh, is where systems and platform providers continue to thrive by providing value to their users. Uh, this is one reason why we uh, try to emphasize uh, Trade Trust is not a platform. Um, now, of course, we do have a website and, uh, you know, things that you can, you know, uh, in a way look at, uh, but in its purest form, Trade Trust actually has no interface, right? But we had to build something in order for people to actually, you know, see something. So that's why we call it our reference implementation. Uh, the URL will be uh, on a slide that's uh, later on, right? Uh, but where Trade Trust really is, is at the services layer, right? And this design ensures minimal coupling and provides the flexibility to cater for changes in technologies in the future. For example, uh, when a quantum resistant cryptography technique is invented uh, and applied to a distributed ledger, well, trade trust can be adapted to plug into that. So it is really an adapter right, to uh, be able to plug the applications into the various blockchains. Now, uh, last year, we actually used um, this co software components uh, to accomplish a transfer of ownership of a ETR between two separate systems, one in Singapore, one in Netherlands, uh, over the public Ethereum uh, blockchain network. So completely separate systems, completely separate uh, platforms. Now, what would be of uh, extreme interest to this community, I think, is uh, are the trade trust design principles. Now, because it is offered to the world as a public good, right? Um, it currently uses public Ethereum, which is a public and permissionless blockchain so as to ensure that no one party has undue influence over the rest. Uh, this is particularly uh, relevant if you were talking about trying to connect governments to this uh, blockchain via the system, uh, via this framework, uh, you know, how sovereign nations can get. So if you now look at the second bubble, uh, sorry, the second principle, Data is not kept on the blockchain so that uh, data confidentiality, commercial confidentiality is uh, preserved. Uh, the third principle is that it's payload agnostic. Uh, this is so that the parties can make use of whichever formats or standards they have already engineered their systems to work with whilst having the ability to adapt and change as they wish at their own pace. The fourth principle, um, it is released on open source terms and its code can be checked by all before they use it. 
And very uh, lastly, uh, the title transfer functionality of the Trade Trust framework is designed to be MLETR compliant. So again, this is another view, uh, trying to reinforce the message that it is not a platform. Uh, it is uh, an approach to help platforms and systems uh, achieve interoperability and MLETR compliant title transfer. And uh, as the Singapore government, right, uh, it, is not our, it is not our intent nor ambition uh, to compete with the private sector or the uh, solution providers out there. Uh, we see our role uh, as one to um, uh, uh, reach where the private sector perhaps uh, find it difficult. So that's why we have conversations uh, at the WTO, uh, at uh, UN, right? Uh, the various uh, events there, right? Um, and of course, we offer the digital infra infrastructure, the software components uh, as a public good via open source licensing terms. So let's now look at, um, uh, I guess, the secret sauce right, of the Trade Trust framework and how it handles uh, transferable records. Wait, I see a comment in oh, shit. oops. Um, right, okay. Uh, so if you look at a paper transferable instrument, right? The, the title ownership and what we call the BL data, right? That's all on that medium, right? Now, when you digitalize it, uh, you can actually split the two. Uh, because we know in a, the, the, the transferable part of the record, uh, the one that changes hands, right? Uh, we call that the title ownership. And we, you know, the rest of it, right? The BL data, the, the port of load, port of discharge, uh, cargo description, blah, blah, blah. The part that doesn't change, right? We, 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 let's just call it BL data. Now we deal with those two parts separately. Let me... Okay, so how do we actually deal with them separately? Okay, uh, the title, right? The title ownership part, that's being maintained in the public blockchain. So if you can, uh, let me orient you to this particular figure. This particular figure has two parts. There's the outer ring, right? That tracks the movement of the BL data, uh, the file and the title ownership information is recorded in the public blockchain. Uh, the little green boxes are the software components um, uh, that are integrated into the various uh, systems. Uh, so the carrier, for example, uh, it, we talk about bill of lading, of course, uh, the carrier would be the one that issues this uh, electronic bill of lading. Uh, perhaps he has a document uh, documentation system. Um, he would issue this electronic bill of lading uh, and the title ownership gets uh, recorded in the various, in the public blockchain. Uh, whereas the actual file uh, would be sent uh, via conventional means. It could be as simple as email uh, or it could be via file transfer protocol uh, however, he currently does it, right? Uh, in terms of sending electronic files to his business partner, he can use that same method. Uh, to other people, so in this figure, you have seller one and trader two who happen to be on a blockchain-based platform for buyers and sellers uh, who capture the transaction inside that particular platform. Uh, however, they capture it, the BL data, right, part uh, gets the, the file, right, the .tt file uh, is what gets transported to the various players. And using that file, they can look up to know at any one time who is the 
real, yeah, who is the title owner, okay? Now, the beauty of this approach is that you don't have to secure that DL file uh, um, uh, too harshly. Uh, you don't have to build all your armored walls around that. Uh, anybody can get a hold of that uh, .tt file or that DL, that DL, uh, because the smart contract is the one that controls who can actually update it, who can who can trans who can update that title holder. Um, so your same file uh, could be lodged with the gov a government authority for customs clearance purposes, and you don't have to worry that uh, they will uh, change the title owner and uh, so on and so forth. So this, this accomplishes um, that same uh, BL file uh, being able to be interoperable, right, across the various ecosystems. Okay. Now, in case you are thinking, okay, well, that's well and good. Uh, well, that will work. Uh, is trade trust really only just for negotiable documents? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can use trade trust for two categories of documents, the normal documents and the transferable documents. Uh, so here for plain vanilla business documents, you can still use trade trust to assure authenticity and the provenance of uh, uh, plain documents. So, um, for example, uh, so here I'd like to allude to a trial that was conducted with Australian Border Force uh, and uh, on certificates of origin uh, between Australia and Singapore, uh, where they used uh, the trade trust framework uh, to uh, run this trial uh, with uh, very, very good feedback from the private sector uh, participants as well. All right. So, this uh, next to last slide is uh, really our, you know, um, is really a slide to show that, um, you know, the amount of interest in trade digitalization uh, is immense. And we have the, uh, I guess, uh, the pleasure of working with uh, many uh, international organizations, uh, ICC DSI being one of that. Uh, and I see that Oswald is also part of uh, the meeting. So a shout out to Oswald. Um, but we do have other governments working with us on this. Uh, we've got Australia, uh, we've got Netherlands, yeah. And um, many other international organizations like SWIFT uh, have also um, uh, joined us in this journey. And of course, we um, you know, want to issue an open call uh, for everybody, uh, anybody, to uh, come and join us on this journey as well. Um, if you are a trade ecosystem player, uh, feel free to uh, take a look at uh, the links. Uh, there's lots of information there. Um, and uh, feel free to uh, reach out uh, for any further discussions. Um, and really, this problem of digitalizing negotiable documents or instruments is just really not a new one. Um, but all the efforts that have come before Right, they, they do so with some sort of gating mechanism, whether it's a platform-centric access or uh, perhaps the registry is a centralized one that is subject to a particular party's uh, control. Well, trade trust is different. You can tell it's actually designed to give its users the freedom of choice of application uh, and still prevent lock-in. So with that, I uh, thank you for your time and attention. And I hand the time back over to Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. That was uh, such a nice presentation. Uh, thanks, Luke, as well. Uh, it was really, really insightful one. And I mean, I would love to, to open, uh, if Julian is fine with it. I mean, I uh, would like to give the word to the attendants today to, to, to have questions from their side, Penny. Uh, I would love. First to start, I mean, with the UK, if you don't mind. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how you manage to uh, to let private world, such banks, financial institutions, and then the administration, the public ones, 
join together in a single environment. Let's find I mean, any any question. I mean, from the attendants. Andrea, it's uh, John Taylor here. If if it's permitted. Nice. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, could I just say a very special thank you to both Luca and Kay for excellent presentations, very clear, and uh, uh, congratulations to both of you for your work in this area. Um, I have one specific question. As a number of you will know, I've been working for some years on the working group of uh, BAFT, the Bankers Association for Finance and Trade that has, has created the distributed ledger payment commitment that is an electronic promissory note that I think has all the characteristics uh, that uh, both uh, Kay and uh, Luca have described. My question though is we believe it is uh, satisfying the Melita's criteria. Uh, does UNCITRAL provide any guidance uh, as to whether it's uh, the requirements of Melita are being complied with uh, for any uh, producer of, of a, an electronic uh, transferable record? Uh, so it's really a question for you, Luca, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, very important question. Uh, we don't uh, provide that guidance. Uh, of course, there are two ways of solving very important problems, as it is usually the case in this field. Uh, there could be, um, you know, traditionally we call it, we, we like to, 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 to call it ex ante and ex post. Mm -hmm. I don't know why this is our legacy. Um, ex post, uh, uh, which is the traditional uh, ancestral approach, uh, it's really in the specific case up to the judge or the arbitrator to verify whether the method was reliable, bearing in mind that obviously um, the, the key element there often is uh, the agreement of the parties. When the parties agree to use a specific uh, method or a specific uh, technical uh, solution, they agree that this is appropriate. Now, that approach, of course, uh, is very flexible. It's very technology neutral, but has the disadvantage of not helping predictability. And therefore, uh, we often see it complemented by the possibility of having uh, some uh, providers who are uh, recognized by a national authority as reliable. Uh, in Bahrain, I think this, the, this system is mandatory. So someone who would operate in provider would have to be licensed first by the uh, oversight authority. In Singapore, uh, it's a mixed approach. It is possible to use uh, any uh, system, it's up to the parties, but there is an optional, I can call it accreditation system if that makes sense, or your recognition or designation system. And obviously those who use uh, that, uh, uh, that channel, they benefit uh, from certain presumptions. Uh, and, and of course that means that uh, there is a reversal of the burden of proof on the reliability of the method, which is very convenient. It's always possible to prove that the method is not reliable, but, um, but uh, uh, of course, in practical terms, that makes a lot of difference. Mm, thank you very much. Yes, um, sorry, could I uh, ask a question? Sure, you can. Yes. Yes. Welcome, Glad right to see yeah. you. I'm I also very, very glad to be here and uh, I'd Definitely like to follow uh, John's uh, um, um, John in stating that it was uh, some very very good presentations. Um, now I um, <clears throat> I wrote a paper on an uh, Ethereum build lading 
and the uh, the M letter uh, a little while ago. And I, yeah, it's a very important legal text and there's a lot happening uh, around it, but also because of it. So definitely a very, very important one. Um, I also think it's very interesting and very cool to see people using the public blockchains uh, as a way of establishing consensus and also precisely Ethereum. Also because there's a lot happening in the space with uh, the Ethereum 2.0 upgrade. Um, so I think there's a lot to be excited about in these coming years. Uh, but I'd just like to get back to the model law. Um, it's on the kind of control approach for establishing the functional equivalence of possession in the virtual space. Um, and this has kind of traditionally been seen as a capitulation uh, to the registry system, which in the past was the only way to establish possession in a virtual space. Um, but the problem with this is that it, in, the, in essence, gives people a symbolic key to a warehouse rather than actually gives them the ability to, to manipulate um, to the extent that might be uh, desirable um, for establishing possession. Um, but the notion of, of control, uh, I think that wasn't, that wasn't uh, defined anywhere in, the, in Melita. Um, to what extent was this a conscious decision? And do you think that there should be a uniform uh, definition? Luca, thank you. Thanks, Niels, and it, it's a pleasure uh, to to hear your appreciation uh, for the model as you are uh, very involved in these matters. Um, control is not uh, defined, but as a functional equivalence to possession. So the legal effects of control are the same as the legal effects of possession. This is one of the issues here is uh, uh, we don't want to upset in any manner existing law. Now, uh, if your question is what is in the end control in, in, in technical terms, then uh, I think that it is clear that uh, control, especially this control, which is uh, exclusive, uh, which means that uh, the person in control, who can be, of course, a physical person, a legal person, a multiplicity of persons at the same time, whatever is possible in, in, in the real world, but should replicate the same uh, type of uh, factual situation that you have in possession. So you would have a definition of possession in national law, for instance, in many Romano-Germanic jurisdictions, you would say, the exclusion of everyone else from interaction with that uh, item. So that would be the same. So yes, okay. it, there, there was a, 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 some thinking behind, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, I think it's quite an interesting kind of legal slash philosophical point when you, when you um, establish your uh, when you kind of establish a, a system um, in order to exclude uh, control, but then, you know, by virtue of establishing a system, you already kind of imply uh, an external control, which is why maybe a decentralized system is legally uh, a, a better uh, way of doing it. Um, thank you for, uh, for answering. Thank you. Any other questions from the attendants? There's a question in, in, in the chat that you may want to look at, Andrea. Yes, there's a question, true. Uh, there's a question, what do you think are the main challenges on adoption and phase? What else is missing? It seems to solve real problems. Who would love to, to, to answer this one? I mean, it's about the challenges in the adoption of this model and this approach by single trade trust. I think it's a question for both of us. Maybe I can go first and Kate can, can do. The, the current, I mean, currently we are uh, at the, the stage where we, we have very strong support from the private sector. And uh, all that we need is to have um, the implementation. Once uh, this is implemented and it's clear how it works and the benefits are clear, then it, it should, uh, you know, that, that would start a snowball effect and that's it. It's the new norm. Um, there was recently, and I'm, 
maybe I can put it in the chat. Uh, there was a, um, a webinar organized by Ancitral. It was actually sup supposed to, to support a different project, but basically one day was only about presentations on MLETR, and the second day too also it was about it. And I will put now the link in the chat. And the, uh, and the, there was something said which is very interesting by Marina Comninos from ESS Docs. In that seminar, and the recording is available on the answer website, she said that um, they have changed the rule book. Uh, and, and this change was approved by the PNI club. So that now they can issue electronic bills of lading under Singapore law and the MLETR. Now, this is the kind of thing that, in my opinion, is missing and the next step to the real implementation of this. Because there we have a, a, a product which is commercial by a commercial provider, but which is now it, it closes the loop because we have everything. We have the law, we have the technology, we have the, the service provider, we have, the, we have everything we need. And so now we just need to start using it and, and to, to, to implement it. So the, the next thing would be for another service provider, doesn't have to be electronic bits of lading, it can be promissory notes, it can be bits of exchange, it can be warehouse receipts to say, yeah, now we issue under MLTR out of choice of law and, and then we are happy with it and we can do it. But a similar thing like because of a decision of the Swedish Supreme Court, in Sweden, it is already possible to issue electronic promissory notes if they meet yeah. certain requirements, which are, so that would be another use case. So I think that what we are, we'll see now, we will see people who will say, yeah, now we, we will, um, we will um, start doing this. We believe in this, we are confident enough. We know the risks, we know how to do it. We just do it and then that's it. Talking about the private sector, look at uh, what about the public one? I mean, um, I saw in case uh, presentation, I saw the mention to the certificate of origin. I know how maybe tricky hot is to to let public institution into this. What about the current situation? Are they comparative into this and going fully digitized? Well, there are some critical areas. I mean, um, maybe I'm asking directly to, to Kay, what were the challenges that they faced in bringing the public institution into this? Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, Andrea. Um, I think uh, the difficulties are uh, not uh, restricted or not limited to just uh, public institutions. I think as with everything, it's about um, getting the knowledge and information out there. Uh, unfortunately, you know, even blockchain itself is, is, is really only gaining uh, uh, better understanding uh, <laughs> uh, uh, only in the recent uh, times. Um, but the problem that we're trying to solve is a very real one. Uh, the cost, you know, the, the, the reduction in cost of shipping is just one, uh, it's just one of the more visible um, uh, 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 dimensions that we chose to bring up. Uh, I think what's more exciting is once every, once the information, once it is digitalized, um, the unleashing of, uh, you know, innovation energies uh, by providers, by companies, uh, uh, would be immense. Uh, I do not think we have yet uncovered all that is possible uh, once we have uh, trade documents digitalized to a very large degree. Um, so that, that's definitely one aspect. Uh, in terms of challenges, public institutions, I guess you could say that public institutions are more risk averse. That certainly is true for some uh, rather than others. Um, uh, but I think as, um, you know, as, as Mr. Lo Sin Yong is, is very, uh, is often, uh, uh, you know, quoted to say, uh, it's, you know, if you look at the innovation curve, right, for uh, uh, innovation adoption curve, you will always have uh, the early adopters, you will always have the laggards. And really, it's about some of us 
showing the rest of us the way, a way, and really taking, taking those first steps and showing the rest of the world, it is possible. It is, it, you know, and unfortunately, the fact is digital negotiable instruments, uh, private sector has uh, had, a, you know, the, the effort started more than 10 years ago. And unfortunately, there is a lot of industry fatigue in this particular area, right? So I think one of the first things is to get over that fatigue to, to explain why now it's different. Now it's not a contractual legal framework uh, discussion anymore. It's statutory. It's, it's an it's a open framework um, and so on and so forth. Um, but yes, that industry fatigue is a very real Thing, uh, to get over. Uh, so these are some of the big uh, challenges, I think. Thanks. It's, no, I'm thinking also of other you know, issues related to this. I'm thinking of you know, the customs authorities they are so reluctant often and they make so much fatigue into this uh, so heavily stuff into paper. Um, you were mentioning, Kay, formally, you know, that you're creating with Australia with other countries, uh, uh, but I see that there are other potential areas. What do you target, I mean, to collaborate with? Are you open or have you got in the future, near future, or middle term future, are there any other areas you targeting to go through with? Um, sorry, Andrea, the, the connection wasn't so good. Uh, were you asking what other areas uh, 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 what are, are we looking at in the future? Yes, my apologies, you know, bad connection today, it's bad weather maybe. Okay, so sorry. No, no, no problem, no problem. Um, uh, of course, the fact is, you know, international trade in, in, in itself is a huge uh, uh, domain. Uh, so, you know, it, it really isn't uh, easy just to, uh, you know, accomplish everything quickly. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, as you saw from Luca's presentation, this class of ne digital negotiable instruments, there are more than just the bills of lading, right? There are other uh, uh, instruments as well. Uh, so uh, at least for, for Singapore, we've really, uh, you know, decided to focus a lot on the bill of lading uh, for now. Uh, but there is obvious applicability in trade to other instruments as well. Um, in terms of other areas, to be perfectly frank, we, we are looking for those who are willing to join us on this journey, um, governments and, and companies alike. Um, you know, we're looking for a coalition of the willing and able, right? Uh, we are very thankful that uh, we have very um, forward-looking governments like China, Netherlands, uh, um, you know, uh, and Australia, who have you know uh, uh, really sought to work with us on real concrete projects and demonstrate that to their to their communities and to the world. Uh, and yes, we continue to look out for such uh, willing and able partners uh, wherever they may be. So you have no boundaries, actually. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question from our friend Joel on the chat, and he's asking: Can bills of lading, which have been created on a proprietary closed EBL platform, to the IMDA public blockchain, so that they can be transferred to parties which have not been onboarded to the closed EBL platform? I think this is for you, Kay, of course. This thing, you know. Uh, okay, certainly I, I will uh, take a stab at this, uh, although I do have other colleagues from the trade team who are also on this uh, channel. Uh, shout out if they would like to also add on. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, when you talk about uh, adopting the MLETR, uh, so I think a couple of dimensions we're going to look at this on. Uh, the first is uh, legal, uh, the other is uh, technical. Um, if you look at it from a, a technical perspective, uh, what we're talking about is the fulfillment of those uh, particular requirements. Um, 
Now, in trade for trade trust, uh, we use Ethereum, uh, we use ERC721 uh, tokenization to achieve the singularity requirement, right? Um, now, uh, we are, I guess, uh, uh, if you've mentioned, if you've uh, met, monitored the news, um, uh, we are indeed trying to uh, look into this area uh, with our work with R3. Um, uh, actually, <laughs> so funnily enough, you know, your, your, your sentence actually just exactly describes what we're trying to, what we're, uh, uh, what we're trying to work out with uh, uh, R3 and Coda EBL. Um, uh, that's on the technical aspect. Now, uh, on the other aspect, which is the legal aspect, uh, that's, that remains something that we have to investigate. Uh, because uh, again, you've got to be a bit more specific about what do you mean by a EBL platform adopting uh, the, the MLETR, um, uh, uh, subject to Lucas, um, I guess, uh, 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 correction. Uh, uh, the MLETR is it's up to a particular jurisdiction to adopt those requirements, and that's what gives it that legal um, recognition. I, I know recognition. Uh, many lawyers tell me don't use the word recognition, but uh, I'm a layman, so I guess I get away with it. Um, that legal, yeah, uh, uh, um, uh, recognition. Yes, um, but uh, but yeah. Uh, we are exactly trying to figure that out with R3 um, as one example. Um, yes, I uh, don't know whether anybody else from the IMDA trade team wants to uh, chime in. Uh, Sin Yong or Marcus? Thank you, Kay. Thanks for answering. Uh, there is another question uh, from the attendance summit about Africa comes from Martin Camara. Uh, he's asking, Africa is implementing African continental free trade area, the innovation, innovation, development, transformation in region. He's asking for advice. I mean, how do you target to do this, to go fast, maybe? I don't know if you... Uh, right, I'm not too sure what the question is though, but... Um, you know, the Trade Trust material, we actually have a website, uh, www.tradetrust.io. I flashed it just now in one of my slides. Uh, all the information, all the technical information is there. The software components are, you know, open source. Like, yeah. So uh, feel free to, to take that and yes, uh, implement it in the African continental free trade area. Um, uh, don't forget the legal part of stuff, though. Uh, but yes, as insofar as the techni technology part is concerned, um, yeah, you can find all that uh, in our website. Perfect. Thank you, Kay. Anybody else who love to make questions to Kay and to Lucas? A good chance to. Thanks, Luke, for, for posting this. Yeah, that's On the link chat. I mentioned before. With um, a lot of a lot of the the materials were were both slides and recording. It's about the MLTR. And I wanted I want to apologize because I, I before I called Trade Trust the platform. Kay correctly said it's not a platform. When I would call it a, an ecosystem, but it's not an ecosystem. It's a community. So you know what. Okay, why don't you talk about trade trust? And I don't talk about trade because <laughs> trade, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, no, but, but uh, you, you have a point because now platforms are regulated and 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 actually trade trust is the opposite of a regulated. It's it's a very open environment. Yeah. No. Sorry, no can I? Thanks. Sorry, can I just um, quickly jump in? Uh, with the, with the one question which may be completely irrelevant to this conversation, and, and though I apologize in advance, but did you have any communication or feedback from banks who are engaged in international trade? I take it that that's directed at 
uh, myself. Uh, I'll take a step yes. at that. Uh, yes, actually, um, we have, since Trade Trust's inception, uh, we have been, uh, you know, constantly uh, uh, listening to feedback from banks, uh, non-banks, uh, you know, uh, carriers, uh, well, everybody who is in that ecosystem. And uh, just in case it wasn't clear, um, Trade Trust is not just a IMDA alone kind of effort. Uh, the Singapore government is uh, taking trade digitalization as a whole of government affair. Uh, so actually, we work very closely with our Maritime Port Authority, which is our, I guess, Maritime Community um, Sector Agency, uh, with the Monetary, Monetary Authority of Singapore, which, of course, is our central bank and governs uh, the, money, the banks yeah, um, uh, as a sector agency. Um, and yes, we do uh, work very closely with banks, um, DBS, uh, Standard Chartered, uh, and we even work very closely with SWIFT. I think I, I think um, one, of, one of the slides had their name there. Uh, so we work with SWIFT as well, who, as you know, uh, are a cooperative, uh, numbering 11,000 banks and corporates. Um, so yes, we do. And I would like to mention also that it's very important for the promotion of the MLEDR, the contribution of the ICC DSI, the Digital Standards Initiative, and there's much more there that has, that has to do with both logistics and with trade financing. And we're going to launch a, a website anytime soon. Uh, I don't know. I saw Oswald before. Uh, I don't know if he's still here or not, but it's a matter of days. Thank you very much. What a great presentation. Thanks, both. Um, hi, um, JC Munger, uh, HSBC. Um, just being a question, maybe more for, for Luca on the. What, I mean, what, what is the, the next in line? Or, 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 sorry, there's a bit of echo. Yeah, there's an echo. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the next country that will uh, integrate uh, the model law into their, their legislation, um, because I mean, as much as, I mean, the, the, the great benefit of this is, is, is really to have the direct enforcement of those, uh, of those documents, uh, I mean, directly into, uh, into, into, into the, the, the legal system. But then for those that have not adopted this, I mean, you will still have to rely on some, uh, contract uh, to revert to the contract law. Um, so what is your, your views on, on, on how much this can be used uh, without having the major trade uh, uh, countries that are part uh, or that have implemented uh, uh, those model law? Uh, thank you. This is a, a very interesting question. And I, I realize I have to give you uh, an answer on, on two or three different points, but quickly mindful of time. Um, first of all, uh, we do promote actively this model law. Obviously, um, we need the help uh, of the private sector. We need the help of governments. We need the help of everyone. Laws that may be passed when they are based on uniform text, uh, they may be passed maybe quicker, but there is the need for the, 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 the legislator to be involved and to be told why it's good and and you know and that's that's the kind of work that we see for instance the the the, the advocacy work that is being done by the ICC including certain uh, national committees. Um, if you just want to know who is gonna who's gonna adopt next, I can tell you that the bills uh, to enact the MLTR and not only because these are broader bills on on uh, electronic transactions law have been introduced uh, in Paraguay and in Kiribati. But, but that's a fact, this is public information that is available. But of course, Paraguay and Kiribati are important countries, uh, but we are not on top five uh, world traders. So the next uh, step is how do we engage these top five or top 20 or top 20? There is a very interesting discussion in the UK, as I mentioned before, and I think there will be uh, some, some evolution there uh, necessarily, but bearing in mind also the specific features of the 
English common law. And then there is also a very lively discussion in Germany. And actually, um, one opinion is that uh, Germany is already, to some extent, or to, to quite a bit, uh, compliant with MLETR. And it's a matter of implementation and implementing regulations and so on and so forth. So um, we see things happening. It's not just a matter of passing the law. It's also a matter of understanding and implementing the law. Um, the, the US has already legislation in this field. The US had for many years legislation on electronic uh, bills of lading, but it was never used until the end of 2020. And in 2020, it was used only for uh, inland waterway commodity shipment. But for instance, in the US, laws on warehouse receipts are being used, electronic warehouse, warehouse receipts. And they're also very compatible with MLTR. So I would say this is a little bit more of you know, a mosaic. Now we see different things happening. There is a convergence there. There are countries like Monaco, the, the, the Principauté de Monaco, where actually uh, the functional equivalence rules of the MLTR has been in, enacted in the law but it's awaiting implementing regulations. And I don't know if there is a market demand, but it's possible to implement it tomorrow. So it's, it's more complex. It's very, it, it, but than just saying, yes, the law has been passed and now it's possible to do that. But we see a lot of action that we didn't see two years ago. There's a huge acceleration because of the effects of COVID. There's a huge demand for information and request for awareness. And then of course, we're here. Whoever wants to discuss how to adopt this law tomorrow, we are here to assist. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Luca. Thanks for those final remarks. I mean, if there is any other, anybody else would like to, to ask questions to Luca. And of course, thanks for asking, uh, Shalonga. So, if nobody else uh, any questions, I think Julian, any question from your side? No, I think I think we've we've we've, we've run over by th by twenty seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. so. <laughs> so that, that, that just means it was very good and interesting and interactive session. We should all be proud, or you should be proud. I think thank uh, you. Uh, and Kay and Andrea have done a great job. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Normally, people try to get out of these things 10 <laughs> minutes earlier. So <laughs> extending it over, <laughs> over the uh, projected time is great. <laughs> thank you, Bijana. Thank you, you know what? Now, now we have to keep up with the level. So it's going to be challenging for us to, to go on this way. But anyway, we, we have excellent Fabrice is excellent, you know, speakers, so it's pretty easy. It was actually. But thank you. Thank you so much. So, Julian, I think you can end up the meeting and, you know, I, I, let's just say thank you. Thanks. I think we're having slight problems, there, Andrea, with, with, yeah. the, with, the, with, the, with the voice and connectivity. But Andrea, thanks for setting us up. And Luca and Kay, thank you for great presentation and, and for everyone being involved and, and turning up here today. And uh, uh, let's continue this conversation. And I think there was a kind of call to action from Kay and Luca uh, to get involved. So please do. Take care, everyone. Keep safe. Thank you. Keep safe and see you in two time on another time slot. Thank everybody. you. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.